Good afternoon or good evening. Oh, I didn't see you come in. Good. It's terrific. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you all this evening. I'm Danielle Allen, the director of the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics, and we are pleased to be a co-sponsor along with the Carr Center and Director Matthias Rissa of tonight's lecture, a lecture that is both a public lecture for the Safra Center and a keynote for the opening of a Carr Center conference that runs all day tomorrow on the 70th anniversary of the UN's uh, Declaration, Universal Declaration of, of Rights, of Human Rights. Um, and the conference is addressing the question of the relationship between artificial intelligence and the human rights legacy. So it's terrific to be able to start here um, thinking about algorithmic fairness. This is an important moment, obviously, for thinking about questions of ethics. The world has woken up to challenges with ethics and technology in a way that those of us who work always in this domain um, sort of sometimes wonder why it takes people um, the time it does to see the salient normative or ethical dimensions of a question. Nonetheless, it's fair to say that the world has uh, generally woken up. And there are some specific reasons for this that it's worth um, identifying out loud. At the heart of lots of people's worries about our current state of affairs is the question of technology and the way it's changing human life. It's, the changes are visible to all of us. Technology is accelerating in the, question, in the, in the space of law, the use of algorithmically based decision making um, that's being integrated into judicial structures. In policy, there are the questions of how to govern technology regimes. These are pressing questions and hard ones. Business is full of new business models. For example, Amazon that are putting pressure on old models of anti-competition policy. So there's a wholesale transformation of the world of work uh, as well, of course, thanks to technology. In medicine, developments from polygenic uh, genetic research, sy synthetic biology and stem cell research are transforming the very definition of the human, our expectations for human life, our clinical possibilities, and our intuitions about fairness and human flourishing. In politics, transformations of communications ecologies and surveillance techniques have radically altered balances of power within and between countries. This rapid technological change has brought questions of ethics to the fore in all of these domains of inquiry. That is, normative questions about what we should do individually and collectively. Those normative questions have, of course, always been with us. And reasonably stable answers to them, though, have been disrupted by the rapidity of this social change. So in other words, although these questions aren't new, there are many places where we had stable understandings of how to answer specific normative questions thanks to the stability of our institutional structures. And as our institutional structures are bending and changing and adjusting under pressures from technology, the normative questions about justice, fairness, flourishing, and efficiency are returning to the surface for fresh consideration. So it's a moment of ferment, and in this moment of ferment, there's a great deal of innovation emerging. Just to give you a couple of examples from the pedagogic realm. It's terrific that in the last few years, the philosophy department, for instance, has worked with computer science to invent a new approach that they call the embedded ethics approach to pedagogy. And this is a model for thinking of the relationship between philosophy and specific domains of positive or technical expertise. This pedagogic model builds on case studies that emerge from a specific field of inquiry and scaffold the ability of students to identify and respond to the ethical issues at stake in the case. This embedded ethics model that philosophy and computer science have developed aligns with work the Safra Center has been doing over the last three years or so to build pedagogic models that rest on a three-legged stool, so to speak, uniting normative inquiry, what we should do, positive inquiry, the descriptive work of the social sciences, and policy, clinical, and other kinds of applied practical work. As with embedded ethics, the Safra Center model does not seek to cultivate interdisciplinary practitioners, right? not trying to build people who in themselves embody the blend of disciplines. Instead, the model rests on multidisciplinary partnerships. That sounds like an academic technicality, the difference between interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity, but it's actually important because it's about the power of partnership to bring the strengths and tools of different disciplines together to answer questions that are harder than any one discipline can answer by itself. It's that kind of partnership that motivates tonight's lecture and the great pleasure and privilege and honor I experience in being able to host Cynthia Dwork this evening. So you all know Cynthia, she is an extraordinary computer scientist, the Gordon McKay Professor of Computer Science at the John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences here at Harvard. 
She's also the Radcliffe Alumni Professor at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study and an affiliated faculty member in the Harvard Law School. She's renowned for placing privacy-preserving data analysis on a mathematically rigorous foundation. A cornerstone of its work was the invention of differential privacy, um, a strong privacy guarantee that Cynthia tells me um, with excitement will now, in fact, be uh, the confidentiality-protecting mechanism used for the 2020 census. So 20 years of work, um, this work started, I guess, in 2002, you said, and the motivating scenario that you had at the time was the question of the Census Bureau and how it thinks about data and privacy, and here we are 20 years later with that technological invention creation being um, built in to the work that the Census is doing. Uh, Professor Dwork is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, and the American Philosophical Society, as well as being a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. With all those accolades to her name, the other thing I want to say about her is just what an extraordinary intellect and human being she is, with a just incredibly voracious curiosity across all domains. It's no accident that she's got an affiliation in the law school and is a Radcliffe professor, as well as being appointed in computer science. And some of us at the Safra Center have had the great pleasure of trying to wrestle with her this semester on the relationship between technological complexities, technical issues and questions in the development of algorithms and the normative dimensions of those algorithms and their use in policy domains. Um, it's been an extraordinary conversation. I've had just a sort of taken great pleasure in the chance to get to know Cynthia and to probe these questions with her. So we will hear from Professor Dwork for about 45, 50 minutes, and then we'll have the chance to open up for Q&A. I also would like to thank Dean, for being here with us tonight. Dean Elmendorf, thank you very much for joining us. We're delighted to be here in your Kennedy School space this evening. So with that, Cynthia. I think I'm going to cry. That was just such a moving introduction. And um, working with Danielle this semester is why I'm here at Harvard. So, um, I've been working on, is the mic okay? Yeah. I've been working on these problems since about 2010. And I really feel like I'm just beginning. So, let me tell you a little bit about what we've learned. The task that we set out to try to, to uh, accomplish was uh, to define what it means for algorithms to be fair and to build fair algorithms once we have this definition. And um, a really lightweight but motivating scenario, this work was done when I was at Microsoft Research, um, started when I was at Microsoft Research. So a motivating scenario might be online advertising. So you have a bunch of advertisers, you're running an advertising platform, you don't know your advertisers, you don't trust your advertisers, they can be absolutely arbitrary people. The decisions that are made about uh, which ads to show to which people uh, are made in a very small fraction of a second, and there's certainly no time to vet anything. And so how do you design something that will sort of be resilient to arbitrarily biased and nasty advertisers. So we have a population that's diverse. It has all kinds of diversity, ethnic, religious, geographic, medical, and so on and so forth. And the concern is what I'll call informally just differential unfairness, that we're treating members of these different groups differently in a way that we feel is unfair. Okay. So, What's the first thing that everybody thinks of? The first thing everybody thinks of is, oh, if we're going to, to have an algorithm that's making a decision whether to show, let's say, a certain advertisement to a certain individual, let's hide from that, uh, that algorithm the sensitive information about the person, which groups they belong to, for example. And that approach just doesn't work, and probably you all know why. Um, essentially, the, the, the sensitive attributes are embedded sort of holographically in all of our information. I mean, the fact that I'm a woman is embedded in many, many different things. The kinds of clothes I buy, uh, uh, perhaps the singing groups I belong to, the dance groups, and so on and so forth. Um, 
So, so there's information that's coded in other, you know, redundant ways, and that's redlining. And there's also a bird of a feather um, uh, phenomena. So, for example, a, a class project of several years ago by Jernigan and Mystery at MIT showed something like this, that if you are male and if five or more of your Facebook friends self-identify as gay, then you're probably gay. So, in, you know, inferring things about an individual by their, the members of their social network and the things that the members of their social network choose to reveal about themselves. So, there's another problem, though, with hiding sensitive information, which is that your classification algorithms will become less accurate. So, here's a really simple, don't take it seriously, example. Uh, suppose you have a minority group, uh, let's say S, a minority group in which um, the bright students are steered towards studying math. And in your majority group, T, the bright students are steered towards studying finance. And now, if you want to write a quick and dirty classifier to find the bright students, it's fine to write a classifier that just looks for studying finance because, after all, it's going to be right on the majority. And that's what you want from an algorithm. It should be right most of the time. But not only is it unfair, but it's of reduced utility. If you're trying to find bright students, you need to know that students in the minority group who are studying math should be viewed as similar to students in the majority group who are studying finance. Or you should be culturally aware to what it is, how things are in the minority group in order to just make a more informed decision. So this also lets me introduce my, my names for the rest of the talk. I'm going to assume that the people in, 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 in our population for now are neatly subdivided into the minority group that likes to flavor their food with sage and the majority group that prefers to use thyme. And the minority group is, is historically uh, oppressed, but that's, that's how we think about them, the sage eaters and the thyme eaters. Now, one thing that's really clear is that you have to collect the salient features for both groups, and they may not be exactly the same. So for example, if for these students, we record simply the single bit of whether or not they study finance, we're not getting the differentiation capability that we want to have on the sage eaters, because the sage eaters let's say none of them study finance and the smart ones study math. So it, it's not enough just to have one bit that says finance or no finance. You have to have at least two bits, one that says finance not and the other one that says math not. Okay? All right. Now, if I say that artificial intelligence, uh, artif AI algorithms or, or machine learning algorithms train on historical data. Is there anybody in the room who doesn't know what I'm talking about? I didn't put my hand up. Yay, okay. <laughs> okay, fine, great. So, um, machine learning algorithms are trying to do a couple of different sorts of tasks. One kind of task is labeling something. Cat or dog. So what you do is you give it a whole bunch of pictures of cats where you label them cat and dogs where you label them dogs and you let them sort of learn what it is that these cat-like things, these things labeled cat have in common and these things labeled dog have in common and what's different between the things labeled cat and the things labeled dog and that's how you, 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 you train it. You give it all that information and then it learns how given a picture in the future of a cat or a dog it can guess as to you know pretty well which one it is. So you could have binary classifications, you could be classifying people as to whether they're well qualified for loans or not, or well qualified for school or not, or whether um, they're at high risk for developing a certain disease or not. You could also be training them to, you could have an algorithm that uh, gets information about large populations and can learn things like what is the chance that somebody will develop a disease given the following medical uh, information about them. So you might be learning a probability or you might be learning a label and that's pretty much what happens. I think that's all you need to know about that. Now, 
one issue with training is that the algorithm is no smarter than what than the data that are given to it. And so if the data have historical biases, if they reflect bias, either because of the choice of features or even in the imposition of labels because you've been oppressing the sage eaters, and so you've been rating them as not qualified when they're qualified and things like that, then that bad behavior is going to be learned by the algorithm. So you can't just say, go forth and learn and reproduce. It doesn't work. And when you think about it that way, though, this whole demand of trying to develop fair algorithms is completely unreasonable. Where is the algorithm going to get the information from? You have to do something to help it along the way, because history is not enough. So we will see something about that uh, later on. Okay. So basically, there's no kind of built into the data source of ground truth, and we're going to have to do something about that. So uh, what's the general way that you go about trying to build something, something really, really new? Well, we have this fabulous paradigm from modern cryptography from the 80s. Uh, and it goes sort of like this. Well, it goes exactly like this. First of all, you have to define what it means for an algorithm to be fair. You have to define your goal. Sometimes that's more easily done by saying, what is it that someone who is trying to be not fair is trying to do? What, what is not fairness? And then our goal is to be not not fair. So you can think about this when you think about, well, in, in terms of, let's say, what does it mean for an algorithm to encrypt messages well? Well, the, al the, the adversary is trying to learn something about the encrypted message, about the plain text before the encryption. So, so you can define what it means for an algorithm to be a good encryption scheme by saying that the adversary can't learn any partial information about the message. So we want to do something similar here. So we want to say, well, here are these various things that an unfairness adversary will be trying to do. Those are things we want to prevent. Now, maybe our list will not be sufficiently um, 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 inclusive. That is to say, we may have not thought of some things. And that's okay, because later when we think of them, we can change the definition and build a better algorithm that satisfies the new definition. In the meantime, we've prevented the things that were on our list in the first place. So it's not the end of the world if it's not completely comprehensive. But in any case, we want to define what it means for an algorithm to be fair. Then we want to construct algorithms that sort of mathematically, provably, satisfy this fairness definition. And finally, Nothing ever is done in a vacuum. There's not just one advertisement, one university student there, one uh, medical estimate that's, that's going on. People are subjected to many, many uh, judgments all the time. So we want some kind of an understanding of what happens when you compose or you build systems from individually fair parts. And so uh, the third part of this paradigm is composition prove something about the fairness properties of the systems that are built from fair pieces. Okay. So today I'm going to focus on two things. Binary classification algorithms, so we're just trying to classify each person as positive or negative, say perhaps high risk for disease or low risk. Um, and the other is what we'll call a probability estimation algorithm. So given an individual X, we're trying to produce the probability that, let's say, somebody will develop an illness or disease. And one way that I like to think about this is that each of us is holding a coin, and the coin has a certain bias. It's not a 50-50 coin. It's not a fair coin. And the coin actually is biased with exactly our probability of, let's say, developing the disease. And at some point in life, that coin gets flipped, and either we'll, you know, we get it or we don't get it. So whenever I say coins, you should say, what is your probability space? I'm not going to answer that now, but you should think about that. Okay. So the, the boundary between sort of scoring and estimation and decision is not all that um, hard. So for example, 
Uh, this is an example of risk assessment scoring, which is uh, used, I think, in um, Santa Clara County to classify arrested children and determine their eligibility for secure detention or release. And so uh, it has fields for, let's say, what was the offense, what were the prior offenses, what were the mitigating factors, and points are assigned for the offense, the, the, the prior offenses, points are then deducted for mitigating factors, and the whole thing uh, gives some kind of a total risk score, which is the sum of these, these quantities, and then that can be translated into a decision by comparing the score to some threshold. Um, so this, so you, you started with the score, which was a number, and you turned it into a yes-no. Um, and depending on the definition, fairness and scoring either will or will not result in fairness in the ensuing decisions. So just a little pointer here, when we think about these things, is the choice of features a potential source of bias? Are there things there that might be biased? Are there things that should be included that aren't being included? Whenever you see something, especially if somebody is claiming to you that it is interpretable, and notice I have that word in quotes, you should, you should start looking. You, and they're saying, hey, look at our features. Look at them and see. Okay, so roughly speaking, uh, definitions of fairness are partitioned into two groups, um, group fairness and what's called individual fairness. So we'll start with group fairness definitions. Group fairness properties are statistical requirements about how different groups are treated as a whole. So for example, as shown in this picture, statistical parity, also known as demographic parity, says that the demographics of the people that are assigned to a given classification are the same as the demographics of the general population. So if your population is, what is this, 25% sage eaters, then the yeses should be 25% sage eaters, and the noes should be 25% sage eaters. That's just demographic parity. So this is a nice appealing notion, and in fact, if you don't have demographic parity, that might be a red flag that says you should look, why? Why don't you have demographic parity? Investigate further. So it might be something that is sort of significant in the breach, but it turns out that it's quite flawed as a solution concept. In other words, it's not sufficient. And um, um, here's one example of a way in which it's a flawed concept. Um, intersectionality. So suppose in addition to having sage eaters and time eaters, we also have coffee drinkers and tea drinkers, and these sets intersect. So you might have an algorithm that has demographic parity with respect to the sage eaters and the time eaters, and it has at the same time demographic parity with respect to the coffee drinkers and the tea drinkers, but the sage eating coffee drinkers are treated terribly. So demographic parity for the individual groups didn't give us what we wanted when we had intersections. There are other problems with uh, uh, demographic parity as a solution concept, but I'm really interested in the intersectional case, so I gave this one. Okay. Now, going back to the situation where we're trying to estimate a probability for each person, um, we could ask for something which is called calibration within groups. So in this model, let's say people are um, uh, given probabilities, assigned probabilities in some particular case of 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 0 0.9. And what calibration within groups says is the following. For each group independently, and for each of these bins with their associated scores, these scores are correct on that group in average, on average. So for example, if I look at all of the sage eaters who are mapped to the bin with probability score 0.1, then in fact the average of their true probabilities is 0.1. And if I look at all of the time eaters who are mapped to the bin with label 0.9, then in fact the true probabilities for all of those people on average is 0.9. 
It could be one, it could be something much less, but on average they will be 0.9. So that means that this sort of this label, this value V is correct in expectation for both of the groups, for the group S, the sage eaters, and for the time eaters. So that's appealing. It says that the, the score sort of means the same thing whether this is a member of S or a member of T. But nothing forces even remotely comparable differentiation. So suppose in both of my populations, I have people whose true probabilities are just zero or one, and in fact, both populations are split exactly 50-50. And suppose my algorithm maps all of the sage eaters to the value of 0.5, which is in fact correct on average, right? You have a bunch of zeros and a bunch of ones, their average is 0.5. But on the time eaters, it's way better able to differentiate, and it maps essentially all of the, uh, yes, I said zeros and ones, but I meant 0.1s and 0.9s. It maps all of the point ones to the bin called 0.1, and it maps all of the 0.9s to the bin labeled 0.9. And it's, you know, it's um, still, it's calibrated, but these groups are not being treated equally at all. In one group, on the sage eaters, nobody bothered to differentiate and find those bright students. So, okay. Now, there are several other uh, notions that are really, really desirable. So, if you're making predictions that are binary, you might want that on the two groups you'll have equal false positive rates, and on the two groups you would have equal false negative rates, and some of you know the punchline here. And you might also want on the two groups to have the same positive predictive value, which is, says that among those who are labeled high risk, then in fact um, the same fraction of them are truly uh, going to be offenders in both SAGE and in time. So the the, the true ones is the same fraction of those labeled one. And the problem with this is they're all desirable, but they cannot all coexist. You cannot simultaneously satisfy all of these three statistical requirements if the base rates are different in the two populations. And there are many variants of this result. This is just one example. So, Pop quiz, is the problem solved by introducing a human into the process? No, because those are statistical conflicts. There is no way of assigning the labels that satisfies these three statistical notions simultaneously, whether it's done by hardware, wetware, or something in between. Another pop quiz, what if we put in a classification deity? Can that solve it? And the answer is not if you believe in free will. So the other approach to fairness is what we call individual fairness, which says very intuitively that people who are similar for the particular classification task should be treated similarly by the classifier for that task. So if you're advertising books, um, um, it's quite possible that for books that have to do with AI and ethics, uh, Danielle and I would be very similar. And for books that have to do with Markov chains, we would be very different, different classification tasks. Um, and of course, the problem with this approach is that you need the right notion of similarity or dissimilarity for the specific classification task, and where is it going to come from? So the statistical approaches, the group fairness definitions, are very easy to articulate, but they're not very meaningful and they're in conflict with each other. This is, I mean, they are meaningful, but they have problems. You can hide a lot of sins inside these things. This notion is, is very meaningful and harder to hide sins inside of, um, but uh, we don't know how to get our hands on the metric, on the notion of dissimilarity. Nonetheless, we're gonna proceed, because I'll say a little bit more about that, um, I do want to make a point. Suppose we're thinking about credit scores, and suppose credit scores are sort of smushed, what is it, between like zero and 800 or something, uniformly, like they're very densely packed. So suppose you think, well, you have to draw the line somewhere. Like this credit score, above this you're in, and below this you're out. Well, then you have two people 
one just above the line and one just below the line, and they're very similar because they're just above and just below, so they're really close to each other, and yet we have to treat them differently because one is yes and one is no. So how do we deal with this? We cheat. We randomize. So you don't get assigned a fixed prob you know, you don't get assigned a fixed output, rather you get assigned a probability of getting an out, uh, an a yes or a no, and then a coin is flipped to determine, uh, with that bias, to determine um, what the outcome is going to be. So, so that way, two similar people should have similar probability distributions on outcomes. So this is nice, but <laughs> there is question still, not only where do we get the metric from, but what is it exactly that it ought to be expressing? So for example, Suppose I have an individual X, and the way we think about this is that our individual has free choice or some internal randomness, and the universe or the environment that the individual acts, interacts with also has randomness and unpredictability in it. And with those two sources of randomness, we can define, although we can't actually compute, the, uh, the probability that X will succeed, let's say, at a nice news organization. X as a candidate employee, this is the probability, pi X, that X will succeed at nice news. So intuitively, if the difference between pi X and pi Y is small, then they should be assigned similar scores or have similar probabilities of getting the job. Okay. So that makes sense, it's what you want. But what if this is nasty news? And at nasty news, the sage eaters are traditionally discriminated against and they're not likely to succeed. And you define success as staying in the job for say three years and having at least one promotion in those three years and the members of S just don't succeed as well. So what is it that the metric ought to be capturing? And this is just a chance to point out that we kind of have two things in mind for some of the applications of fairness. One of them is kind of, what's our probability of success in the ideal world where everybody is treated well and is able to, to achieve her greatest potential? And that's, we call those Q stars, probabilities. And then there's the real world, which is nasty, and people are oppressed and beaten down and so on and so forth. And they have a different probability of success, which is P star. And so the question is, which, which one are we sh should we be talking about and when? If we're trying to predict health outcomes, clearly the real world is the real world and you want to know. But if you're trying to figure out how you should treat people so that they can maximize their potential, you might want to be talking about Q star. How do you get your hands on it? I mean, it's not in the data, right? How do you know? Okay, so let's talk about algorithms for a bit. Um, I've been talking about fairness, but fairness isn't the only question. We want the algorithm to actually be useful. So in the advertising for scenario, for example, for each individual, there could be a value or somehow we always talk about the lack of value or the loss that's incurred by showing this ad to this individual. But it's, we can write it down. So the, the vendor, the person who's trying to do the advertising may have some notions of these are the people that I really would value sending to and these are the people where I don't want you to send it because it's basically a loss of money for me. I'm not going to get anything from it. Or I'm not a nice person and I don't want you sending that ad because I'm just nasty. And so I view this as high loss. Remember, we don't know, we don't trust our vendors at all. So, but the, loss, uh, the losses can exist and they can exp the vendors can express them. And then we can assemble our information into a solution, which is actually um, expressed as a linear program, which basically is intuitively, it just says, minimize the utility loss subject to the fairness conditions that similar people should have similar probability distributions on outcomes. So the loss function is viewed as a soft constraint. We make best effort. Whereas the fairness constraints, those are hard requirements. Fairness conditions are hard requirements. We insist on fairness and we allow people to maximize revenue subject to those conditions. Okay, so there's a solution that is given a bunch of people and these loss functions and the metric, you can figure out how you should assign 
um, adds to them or whatever your outcomes are. But what about people that you haven't seen yet? So, um, because it's, it would be really nice if all this work that you spent figuring out how you should advertise to individual people, you could actually extend to new people who are coming. Or to who, if you spend a lot of work deciding very fairly for, uh, for a couple of years of students how you should be offering um, ad admission, then it would be nice to leverage that for future students, for future <coughs> classes. So that process is called generalization. And the punchline here is that uh, if you relax the requirements a little bit to what we call a probably approximately fair, as is done always in traditional machine learning, then you get generalizability. So now, what about building the metrics? So this is work, um, very recent work of my student, Christina Alvento. Um, Christina's suggestion is to combine insights from human interaction studies or understanding of what humans can do well with uh, insights from machine learning to build a metric. And I'm just gonna give you a little bit of the flavor of what she did. So first of all, there are certain kinds of questions that people find apparently easy to answer. So I'm showing you three candidates, A, B, and C, and an easy-ish question is, which of A and B is closer to C? So apparently humans have a pretty easy time with that. What they have a hard time with is quantify the distance between A and B. So this relative thing is pretty easy, but this quantify the distance is hard. Okay. Now, what we really want is for, if we have N people, we want all those N squared pairs of distances, the hard distances. So that sounds like N squared hard queries. And she shows, uh, so her first observation is that you don't actually need to do something like that. So in a particular very simple scenario where you're trying to, we have kind of a one dimensional measure and you're trying to just classify people yes or no, you can use easy queries to sort the points according to the distance from a worst or a best element. And once you've got them sorted, then you just use the hard queries to find the distance between adjacent points in the ordering. So instead of having n squared hard queries, you have n log n easy ones and n hard ones. And in fact, you can even get by with a constant number of hard queries. Now, of course, her work is much more general than this. It's not just this simple case where everything is nice and linearly ordered, but it gives you a little bit of the flavor of how you can be creative and use some human inputs in a not horrible, horrible, horrible way that um, uh, lets you to start actually to build a metric. But you have to have somebody you trust for these human inputs. Okay. Now, I want to mention just a couple of additional approaches um, so that when you leave here and you start following the computer science literature, if you're not already doing that, you'll know what some of these things are about. One is what's called learning a fair representation. Now, the general idea here is the data are presented to us, each individual is actually some point in a very high dimensional space where some of the dimensions have to do with you know, attributes and histories and how old you are and what books you've read and all these sorts of things. And in the, in the fair representation approach, you try to find a different representation for the data, typically much lower dimensional, that will stamp out the sensitive information. So that stuff that I said was holographically in, embedded, you're trying to stamp it out and yet you want to retain sufficient information to, to permit standard training. Now, there are many reasons to be skeptical here, but this is also really exciting and intriguing. And I, I, I think it makes sense to continue to think about it. So I think it's a very fun direction. The other is a more standard theoretical computer science approach. Uh, there are algorithms, one for fairness, you've, you've seen calibration. Remember calibration, we're assigning estimates of people's probabilities, and we require that for, 
for each of the output bins with a value V, the average true probability of the people assigned to bin B uh, is, that, is the value that's associated with that bin. So the, the, uh, the things are right on average. Um, you can, uh, so what, what these algorithms do is one of them will give you calibration simultaneously for large numbers of intersecting sets. And I will tell you a little bit later, if there's enough time, why I find that so, so interesting. Having said there are some things I don't like about calibration, there are still things I like a lot about this approach. Um, and the fairness results, uh, in so, so the calibration stuff is sort of correct on average, and the fairness stuff is fair on average in some appropriate way of defining it. And the fairness results have to leverage uh, some limited access to a fairness consultant, just as Ilvento's work had to make use of a human oracle. And there's another approach that's out there in the literature, um, which is causality-based. So these people think about uh, data generation models and um, uh, classifiers that are built on um, and that work with these data generation models. And the definition of fairness is intended, given the model, to rule out effects that are sort of caused by being a sage eater. So. I think this is really fascinating, and some of the literature on this clearly is motivated by a spirit of wanting individual fairness, although the algorithms don't necessarily quite get there. Um, but there is an issue that I don't understand how is going to be dealt with in the long term, which is there is a maxim in the statistics world, especially with respect to prediction uh, models, is that all models are wrong and some models are useful. And if your definition of fairness is tied to your model, and if, as is often the case, given the data, you cannot tell which of several different models gave rise to, that, to those data, well, if the model is wrong, then I don't understand what the definition is giving you. It's not really telling you about the real world. So if it's, it may putatively be fair, but it's not fair. And indeed, we've come up with examples where things are fair under the definition and no human being looking at that would say it was the least bit reasonable. Okay. And then there's this. Okay. So, um, I have just a couple minutes left, right? Composition. So there's a lot to say about composition, and I'm only going to say a little bit about it. Um, again, this is recent work with my student. So you might have the intuition that if all of the parts of your system are fair, then in fact the system as a whole should be fair. Whatever fairness means, this is a nice intuition. It would be great if it were true, but the reality is that it is complicated. And it's not automatically going to be the case, and I'll give you a really simple example from the advertising world. So I'm going to have two advertisers, and the two advertisers, do you know how ads are placed on your screen, banner ads? You know that there's, there's actually an auction that goes on. That space in a fraction of a second is auctioned off to the highest bidder. So this happens. So we're going to have two advertisers, each one of which is completely fair on its own. One of them is advertising uh, for tech jobs. So it's a company and it has a job and it's advertising for candidates. And the other one is advertising for a grocery delivery service. And they're battling it out for this banner ad at the top of your web page when you go see the New York Times, let's say. So what happens? Well, one way to think about it is one of them bids a lot and the other one bids a little. And this is an auction. So the one who bids a lot, you can think of as simply going first. So my grocery service decides whether or not to bid on somebody. 
and it's bidding a dollar. Now, the tech company bids among those, basically, that are not claimed by the grocery store. Why? Because they're really bidding on the same people, but the grocery store wins because it's bidding more. So it's as if it's going first, and the dregs are left for the tech company. OK, I didn't mean that, but. <laughs> <laughs> now, when do people really, really, really get aggressive advertising from the grocery delivery service? When in real life? Do they get this? When they have a new child. And the web knows when you have a new child. Okay? And then suddenly you're a target, and then, because if they get you then, when you really need the help, then you're probably going to be a customer for years and years and years. And you're extremely highly valued in real life. So that means that the new parents aren't seeing the tech jobs ads. Okay? Now, this actually, so, and the system isn't fair as a whole. And it's the, it's the competition that's making it unfair. Each of the two classifiers is perfectly fair in isolation, but because they're competing with each other, the, the one that's paying more is winning, and the results are unfair on the population. Notice that the tech company may be behaving very, very well, and not knowing and, and not touching with a 10-foot pole your parental status. But because its competitors are legitimately looking at the parental status, it's hurting parents. Okay. Now, uh, there is a non-naive solution. I mean, the na so naive solutions don't work. There is a non-naive solution. Um, uh, it can be expensive for the advertising platform, and it's an interesting question how much we can improve on, this, on the simple uh, non-naive solution that we have. So that's a little bit about composition. And in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to talk briefly about um, group remedies, so fair affirmative action, or fair with our notion of fairness, affirmative action. So one way of trying to get some kind of affirmative action is through rankings. So many of you probably know this example, that universities of Texas and California offer to the university, offer university position, um, uh, attendance to the top 10% of the students in each high school class. Okay. Uh, my understanding is that this works better at integrating the university in Texas because the schools are more segregated to start with. Another example, uh, this is due to John Romer, Stratify the students according to the education level of the mother. Within each stratum, rank the students according to the number of hours the student spends on homework per week, let's say. And then admit to the university the top K percent from each stratum where K is chosen so that you get your university class of the size that you want. Um, so. We've, both of these are sort of splitting people into disjoint sets and then ranking within the set. And another example from Professor Allen um, is a, a sort of a, sorry, degenerate form of this because <laughs> we're not really ranking. We're not getting the full power of ranking. But it's, it's the solution, solution she proposes is to stratify students according to their uh, sorry, SAT and or G, some combination of SAT and grade point average. And basically, to discard, I shouldn't have used the word stratify, just discard all of the students below um, uh, a certain fixed threshold, so below a 1,200, let's say, on the SATs. And then among the students who are left, you, so I guess the stratification should have been according to zip code. You admit randomly so as to maximize geography, geographic diversity, I meant to say. Okay. So, um, I'm sorry? At level of zip code, zip plus four. Yes. Um, good. So, suppose you have, you're doing one of these schemes. These schemes are similar. Um, in Danielle's case, she just threw out everybody below a certain threshold, and then she's dealing with everybody else that's left. So 
here's a very, very simple version of what we can do in the, um, uh, if, we're use, if we have a metric. So suppose for simplicity that we actually had the same number of sage eaters and thyme eaters, okay? Then what we do, we have distances for each sage eater. There's a distance to each of the thyme eaters that's given by our metric. So what we do is we pair for each sage eater SI a single thyme eater TI so that we minimize the sum of the distances of the pairs. And then to classify somebody, a sage eater, we go over to their corresponding time eater and we see how we classify the time eater. And one byproduct of this is that we'll get um, uh, demographic parity for free. That if we you know, give admission to the school to a third of the time eaters, we'll give it to a third of the sage eaters because of this one-on-one -on -one pairings. Now we'd really do something more complicated than that, but this is the gist of it. Now, in general, we know how to handle multiple disjoint groups or strata in Romer's case or the zip plus fours in, in Danielle's case. Um, if we have a metric, we just handle them separately and in parallel without a metric from something called a fair ranking, which I will not get to today. And uh, in Danielle's case, um, we would have in this, like the purple group, we'd have everybody in one zip code who is above threshold and they're sort of all equally close to all of the time eaters, uh, which is in a zip, different zip code, all equally close to the uh, rosemary eaters. Okay. But the intersectional case for this sort of approach remains open. We don't have a clue how to deal with that yet. It hasn't been a subject of a lot of work, but it's interesting. So, some final remarks. Skewed or rescued? Um, when the data are sufficiently representative, in all ways, then we're rescued. I mean, you know, that we really can get a lot. We can really get rid of a lot of human bias and exhaustion and just kind of the vagaries of dealing with humans before and after lunch. When the data are insufficiently representative, things really are skewed. And you have to do something assertive to take care of that, to address that. So can computer science help? Well, this looks like a complicated slide, but you actually already know the first three bullets. I'm reviewing what calibration is. The calibration, again, says within a group G, the bin labels V are correct in expectation. Multi-calibration simply says that for a collection C of possibly intersecting groups, uh, the scores are calibrated for every single group in C simultaneously. So not just for disjoint groups, but for complicated intersecting groups, you still calibrate simultaneously. Why do I like this? Well, we can take our collection C to be all sets for which membership, membership is easy to compute given the data. And it can be really easy to compute. And what I like about this is the following. Let's say you have a whole bunch of data about people and how they're being treated. And you're trying to understand, you're trying to know is there a group that has been mistreated. Then what you want to do is you want to sort of think, okay, let me look at these various sets and see if they're really being treated fairly. But it's not always clear that, you know, how do you figure out which sets you should look at? So going through some historical reading from the 1800s and the things that women said about themselves and their abilities and the way they put themselves down, at least in writing, you know, maybe even these people did not think of checking to see were they being treated fairly because they didn't expect to be treated equally. So here, if we're, if we're just able to ensure this kind of, the right kinds of parity for everything that's sort of easy to describe, we should probably capture all of the traditionally underrepresented groups without putting the onus on the members of that group to fight for themselves. It'll happen automatically. And so I find this really, really intriguing. That's why I like that stuff so much. 
So yes, I think computer science can help, I think, in directions like that. Can computer science manage without wise inputs? Not for now, no, I don't think so. Can the input process scale? I don't know, I think it's a really interesting question. You know, to have one wise woman giving all of these estimates of who's similar to whom, it's like it's a lot of work, so it's too much. Um, defining fairness is a political process. You know, Danielle uh, kindly mentioned the work on privacy. Privacy was a breeze compared to this because while people didn't all agree on privacy, it was on what it meant, it was possible to come up with a definition that everybody was able to at least find compelling. Here, I don't believe that's the case. And I think that uh, in different contexts, it's going to be radically different anyway. Um, so who chooses the definition for the context and how? We like to use randomness. Is randomness okay? So I've got 10 people that need to be imprisoned and five prison cells. Do I choose randomly? Is that okay? Is that fair? You know, the, my colleagues in the law school, you know, they go like this. <laughs> All right. um, standards of accuracy are context dependent. So in some cases, you really, really, really want to be as accurate as possible. And in other cases, it's not that big a deal to get it wrong. So, you know, okay. And just one example where it is high stakes, my last comment. Um, there was a mention of recidivism prediction earlier. So there was a report to the president uh, from the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology about forensic science in the criminal courts. And they were talking about things like, what are the kinds of standards you should have for DNA matching? That was pretty easy, but hair samples, fingerprints, and so on and so forth. You know, feature, methods of looking at features of individuals and deciding whether there's a match or ruling out a match. So those are both important in the context of law. And they, they sort of lay out what they call foundational validity and validity as practice. So foundational validity was things like um, that the method should produce, should have reproducible and consistent procedure for identifying features with, within the evidence samples in the first place, comparing the features, determining whether there is a match, determining whether there's not a match, empirical measurements of false positive rates, or false negative rates, or both actually. Um, so that's sort of foundational validity. That's what you want if you're going to be using something in a high stakes decision. I don't think I've seen any real discussion of you know, holding machine learning algorithms to this standard, even when they're being used in this kind of a situation. So invalidity as practice basically says, is the person who actually carried out the test capable of carrying it out correctly? And we could apply that also in the machine learning setting. So that's what I'd like to end with. It's just like there are real um, practical things that, that we can do right away to, uh, to try to use these things more wisely. So thank you very much. So there's so much to talk about. Floor is open. Arthur? So thank you so much. Whoa, too much. That's, thank you. So I, I need to preface my question by saying I don't mean this to be dismissive at all. It's, it's like a genuine, curi genuine curiosity. So I was born in a different century. So all this AI stuff is kind of new. And um, so suppose I knew nothing about AI and nothing about algorithms. But I knew something about old-fashioned you know, econometrics, old-fashioned statistical estimation. And I didn't care at all about fairness. I just cared about accuracy. So how much of your talk would have been pretty much the same, just flipping some words around, if your topic was you know, ac you know, reducing error terms in probit estimation? Great. So let's start with our basic paradigm. First of all, defining the problem becomes trivial. Uh, so the definitions part, check. 
and my talk would be, the whole first third of my talk at least would just be irrelevant. Algorithms, well, the econometricians probably look at all sorts of algorithms and they know, you know, they have the things they need to compute, they know when they have closed forms, when they don't, and so algorithms research, very similar. Um, and composition, uh, probably composition is easy. So it's a completely different world. The, 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 the problem that we're trying to solve is completely different. It's not so well formed. The algorithms part is the same, and the behavior under composition is really surprising. So there, can I put an ad additional piece on Arthur's question for a second? Sure. So I mean, it seems, I take it that part of what's implicit in your question is how various features of statistical methodology came to be, to sort of, uh, be connected to the concept of fairness. So, for example, if you take the parity concept in the first instance, mm -hmm. um, you know, why does that become a fairness concept inside of statistics? That is, insofar as the concepts of fairness now have their own life in the world of statistics, that itself is a story that requires a certain amount of explication um, in addition. I take it that's part of the contrast you were drawing, sort of between the fairness and the accuracy concept? Your question is much smarter than mine. <laughs> Your answer is much better than mine. <laughs> Um, thank you. So um, I was really surprised and taken aback by your uh, reference to the paradigm from uh, public key encryption in a way, because uh, I'm a historian studying exactly that moment of uh, developing those systems. And I guess I was wondering if the source of uncertainty and mistrust in those systems is, is actually analogous. And maybe I'm not sure at what level you're pitching that as the paradigm, but if we look at how public key encryption assumes uh, sort of... Uh, malicious sort of actor that is trying yeah. and, and to solve the problem of key distribution. The idea is that you don't want to trust anything in the middle <laughs> in that kind of sense, whereas the, the message that will be um, passed between the two actors is the thing that needs to be guaranteed mm -hmm. uh, in some sense, whereas the source of uncertainty that you highlighted prior to that was there's no ground truthing for the data. It's almost like the message is uncertain. Um, and actually, we have to trust all the different actors that debate the definitions and debate um, the wa different weighing mechanisms and all these things and distribute the biased key, uh, biased coins and things like that. So it seemed to me like it introduces a lot of uh, these so-called intermediaries, we might call them, you know, um, uh, institutions of expertise into a system where the, at least the paradigm in public key encryption as I've been um, understanding the concerns there was to exactly sort of vacate those roles, if that makes sense. So, um, so I've done a fair amount of work in encryption, and when we worked on privacy, we, s we followed this paradigm, but things were different there because in encryption, you have a legitimate receiver of the message, and you have an eavesdropper. And one of them is supposed to get everything, and the other one is supposed to get nothing. In the context of privacy-preserving data analysis, your analyst and your adversary are the same person. So we've already had this experience of making the paradigm work even when you're shifting and playing around with the roles. And it was certainly uh, extremely helpful to us in what we did was we sat down and we wrote what are the things that bad guys do. And then whenever we thought of a potential solution concept, we said, well, uh, does this rule out the things on the list? Which is very much a cryptographic approach to things. And often it did not rule out the things on the list and we said, okay, you're not a solution concept. So um, I think as a general methodology it works and in the details it will be very different. Yeah, but I'm very interested in your study of the history. I look forward to hearing about that. Yes. Um, I got another one here uh, behind you. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, the um, use of uh, the SAGE and time groups um, uh, leaves out something that I'm a little confused by, which is some groups are discriminated against, some aren't. Yes. You might care about groups uh, that are uh, different skin colors without caring about differentials among groups of different eye colors. And so my question is, do the algorithms 
uh, discover, say, unwitting discrimination groups, or is this something that human beings always have to input uh, into the system? So that's what I liked about the multi-calibration that I mentioned at the end, that you don't have to explicitly name what are the features. You're handling these things automatically anyway. It will, you know, d testing somebody's eye color, that's a really easy computation. Seeing skin color is an easy computation. So the, the, the conjecture is that the things that discriminate, that people have discriminated against, uh, on the basis of which people have discriminated, are actually simple computations. And so we will catch them. So uh, I don't think we, in ideally we wouldn't even have to list all of them. They it would just happen automatically. So, uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, when I, I said we need cultural awareness, and I think we really need cultural awareness. And so you can use these things to sort of test for fairness on sets that you didn't think of asking about, but, uh, but getting it right at this point I, st I still think needs human intervention. Can I add a footnote there? Please. Says, yeah, the rights would be sort of a replica of our reading group conversation a little <laughs> bit. Um, just to say, I think that sort of another feature perhaps of questions to take the example of um, you know, an algorithm that's helping employers identify employees and the sort of thing they're trying to predict is success in employment, so this is the nice news versus nasty news example, right? And so if nasty news is a place that discriminates, then people from a group that's discriminated against are less likely to succeed. The algorithm will identify them as less likely to succeed. And so in some sense, the question you're asking is, will the algorithm know that what it's actually identifying is pre-existing patterns of discrimination or not? And the answer to that question is extremely complicated, in fact. So no, it's not straightforwardly the case that the algorithm will always identify a differential between two populations as having been the result of discrimination, right? But insofar as the underlying data that is being used to train the algorithms um, in itself encodes discrimination, as Cynthia was saying with the holographic metaphor, um, the often what look like sort of valid classifying um, differentials will in fact be encoding sort of underlying patterns of the consequences of discrimination. Did that respond? Yeah. I should have asked people to say who they are too, if you don't mind just, just telling us uh, who you are, name and sort of area of interest. If you um, my name is Josh, I'm at, I'm at CES, and I am interested in all this kind of stuff, and I was uh, wondering what you thought about this, uh, like well, you brought this up at the end, that there are different types of fairness definitions that need to be applied in certain situations because justice isn't something that you can sort of just say like this is what it is and put it all over all problems and you're and it's solved and then that sort of seems in tension with this idea in uh, artificial intelligence that you want to deploy machines that can sort of work at a big scale and lots of different situations and i was wondering if you think that um scale and the particularities of like of fairness are in are like always going to be in tension with each other or, or not? I don't know. <laughs> I, you're, you're asking whether things will be able to scale at some point? Mm -hmm. Is that basically Yeah, basically, it? yeah. So I have to say that for reasons that I'm not clear on, I'm optimistic, and that's why I'm still working on it. But I, I, I can't explain to you why I think it's the case. Hmm. Interesting. The row right behind you, I think. Is, is, did I see a hand? We have a little. I'm not looking over to your right, exactly. <laughs> so I'll come to the right. That would be great. Yeah, Rachel? Oh, I thought somebody was already. I think I was. <laughs> okay, so I had a question about the. Uh, Sorry, I'm, I'm Rachel, I'm a graduate student, at, uh, fellow at the Safra Center, I'm a PhD student in the philosophy department, so I do ethics. Um, uh, I was interested in, in the idea that, uh, of calibration, I don't know what you called it, multi-calibration, multi multi okay. Um, and how you move from, right, so I take it that like what that can do is uh, test whether a data set that you're inputting is, is treating like certain groups in a certain way, and so maybe you can discover that you didn't know that that or that that's true in a data set. Is that right? 
Yes, I think uh, you can use the technology to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so I'm curious about how it works, like how it works moving from that process to then uh, the process of, of designing your algorithms. So like say, say right. like what can you do? Okay. Do you just throw away certain data sets? Does human inter, because presumably right. there are mm -hmm. some ways in which uh, groups are being, you know, or there are different results for different groups that are precisely what you're trying to track with your algorithm, right? So. so that's a great question because if we knew how to sort of solve the whole problem or what to do when we noticed that there was unfairness, you know, you just say, yes, there's unfairness. Now what do we do? So, so we don't know how to handle that, but, there's, but it, it gives us a way of thinking about uh, if we have great, great powers of testing, what should we test for? Where do we look for red flags? That's how I think about it. Um, I'm Charles Peterson, and I'm also a grad fellow at the Safra Center and a PhD student in American Studies here. Um, so listening to your talk, I was reminded of, um, so I'm a historian, I was reminded of a, what strikes me as a similar case from the 1940s where a team of law professors at Harvard um, were basically hired by the NYPD to create a system, an algorithm, um, to predict recidivism among basically the black population in, uh, in New York. Um, and so the, they, you know, they ran a lot of equations, they gathered a lot of data, um, and they came up with you know, a form very similar to the one that you showed from Santa Clara. Um, and they wanted to test it to like, find out whether or not it was valid. Um, and the NYPD was like, oh yeah, you can go do that, but we're just gonna take your algorithm and use it right now. Mm -hmm. And, they, and then they ran it, and it didn't have validity, and the NYPD was like, we don't care, we're just gonna keep using this thing, because it right. does what we want it to do. Right. Um, and it just struck me that in a huge number of cases that you brought up, so um, credit scores, college admissions, um, the determining effect for a lot of them is not going to be the accuracy or validity of the algorithm, it's going to be the power relations, the profit motive behind them. Um, and moreover, that you know, in this case, in the 40s, the association with the law professors, with the aura of science, right, right. lended it a great deal of authority. Mm -hmm. And so by using the rhetoric of fairness mm -hmm. um, in these algorithms, mm -hmm. we bring legitimacy into these arenas. Mm -hmm. So like, just to take the example of advertising, I mean, it struck me that, um, you know, in the case where you say, well, we'll, we'll jump, you know, we'll, we'll always hold these, um, these fairness constraints you know, as, as inviolable, um, and you won't be able to, to, you know, make profit past them. It just struck me that, you know, I mean, that's probably the story that they'll tell, but that uh, you could actually hugely increase the amount of fairness constraints, and that most companies are just not going to allow that because the profit motive is so, is so strong. So, I mean, basically, I'm just asking, right. to what extent are you providing legitimacy to these systems of power? I'll just quit now, thank you. <laughs> so, um, great. <laughs> I, uh, I understand very, very well what you're saying. I don't believe that the answer is to quit and leave it to people who don't have my values and my sensibility. So um, I don't think I have an option. <laughs> you know, I think that somebody needs to really be thinking about these things hard and well. And <laughs> that's it. First, I have a comment. This happened to me at the National Academy of Engineering. I was on the wrong side of the room and never got noticed. But it was part of a talk on implicit bias and how to judge <laughs> candidates for fellowship. So I used it as an example. Um, so I want to follow up on, first I want to say these guys asked really good questions. Um, but I want to follow up on this question and your answer. I, I'm Barbara Gross. I'm a faculty member in computer science. And I do research in AI. Um, uh, which is what is our responsibility as computer scientists to be clear about what our algorithms and our theorems do and don't say 
so that there's less possibility of abuse. Well put. I thought you had an answer. <laughs> oh, you want me to respond to that? I agree. And I, so, yes, we have a lot of responsibility, and that's why I like theorems, because you can say, this is what we do, this is what we don't do, this is what's not doable, and after the, I mean, we don't abdicate responsibility for what happens after that, but we have to bring that kind of light to the conversation. And the same thing happened with privacy. People say they want all sorts of things. You, you can't have it, and you provably can't have it. And if you don't understand that you can't have it, then you start, you know, you compromise people's privacy left and right. Um, there are companies that are using differential privacy as window dressing, sure. Do I like that? No, but yeah, I think it's good to have the technology for the people who want to use it seriously. Yes, yeah, so I have another follow-up to that. I'm Tina Aliasirad. I'm a um, computer science professor at Northeastern. I work on machine learning and data mining. So the question that you brought up is about incentives of the human decision maker, which is extremely important. So right now, a lot of the algorithms are being used for efficiency purposes, not that the answer that the algorithm is giving is quote unquote more fair or not, right? The judge has a lot of cases and he just wants to quickly go through it, so having a risk estimate is really easy for him to go through that. And also there's this um, additional barrier, which is that the judge doesn't want to, for example, let a person who the algorithm gave a risk estimate of eight out because what if that person commits a crime and then this judge is gonna be on the front page of New York Times, oh, the judge did not listen to the algorithm. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like the incentives of the human decision maker should be built into the objective function of the algorithms that we're working on. I'm Eric Bierbaum in the Department of Government and Social Studies. And I wanna ask about um, markers of discrimination that are more complex, so n not eye color, but um, say someone's judgment that a person is creepy. Uh, I, I read, a, there's, a right. scientific, there's a psychological article that, that noted that too much eye contact or too little eye contact could both be markers of creepiness, right? <laughs> and, and so you might, uh, <laughs> the article itself had a kind of creepy quality, I mean a second order <laughs> creepy quality, right? but, um, but I guess it, it was, you know, sort of, this was a sort of handcrafted look at the algorithms that we are sort of implicitly using the, when we make that judgment. But I take it that uh, in light of this talk, one could, uh, could think of other ways by which a marker that we, we generally wouldn't, we would not raise that as consideration in a, 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 a traditional job hiring setting. We might find other ways to describe the behavior, right, uh, that, that may pass muster. I don't think that term would pass muster as an omnibus term. Uh, but that is a, that's a kind of uh, a marker for a complex discriminatory uh, target. And just does the talk bear out uh, to, to these ineffable constraints that bear upon that? Or? So, 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 um, so first of all, you're saying that creepiness doesn't have a simple description. Yeah. You're probably right. <laughs> um, it's an interesting question. Is it appropriate or inappropriate to discriminate against creepy people? I mean, is, is there something that's hard-coded in us that's telling us that this is a dangerous person? Because yeah, I don't, it's a, it's a very, very interesting question and I'll have to think about it. I don't have a ready answer. But it's not that you think that the, uh, the, the kind of uh, ways of, of, I'm thinking about my colleague uh, who thinks about partisan fairness, and, uh, you know, and that judgment of cracking and packing, you could apply a similar kind of approach to uh, making sense of this is what the concept really is, this is the core, and then it might look more or less morally salutary, I, I take it. So, maybe. I'm sorry, what is your question? What that are you the, asking me? That maybe the term, once we actually specify it further, using some of the, uh, the ways you've dis distinguished uh, different approaches to tea, for example, could, could make it uh, a, a term that we would understand what, what makes it something we ought not use in a certain setting. So hiring, for example, right. or perhaps we should. Right. So. What I would say is, you know, if, if something came up that, was, that looked anomalous, it, it's a flag for further investigation and maybe that investigation would lead to this notion of creepiness and then you have to have a discussion about 
whether it's appropriate or inappropriate to make decisions based on creepiness. And I don't, I don't have an answer to that question. Um, I, I could imagine it going either way, and I, I just don't know. So that was one of my sort of thoughts too as I was listening to this, that, that all your comments about red flags, the various kinds of um, definitions that were valuable in the breach as red flags um, meant that in fact the work on algorithms has generated um, a, a body of fresh possibility for actually diagnostic work around discrimination which probably isn't, it hasn't been used that way, that was to use it the opposite way in some sense from how it's intended but it would be another way of making use of what's been generated by all this work. Right, it would, it basically, it's a way of noticing or having brought to our attention patterns that are in the historical data. And um, then we can decide whether these are patterns we want to perpetuate or not. So I'm just going to take two more questions which are almost out of time. So gentleman in the baseball cap over here. Sorry, and then I'm going to come back. I need to, I need to that part of the room too. Uh, first, I want to say something. I'm very, very sympathetic to what you are trying to do, and I disagree with the, um, uh, the view that you are enabling uh, kind of uh, centers of power or what have you. I think it is, it's exactly the opposite. I think this is a challenge to them to bring those issues in, in, um, uh, of, of fairness. But I, my only suggestion or, or remark that um, to use a philosophical language that your approach is empirical, is Aristotelian, you start from groups, then uh, you cannot avoid universal definition of fairness. And any violation of that definition in scales and collaborations with different degrees will be considered unfair. We do that in physics. In physics, basically, you have, say, quantum mechanics, you use it, and anything that does not agree with it is not right. So the trick is to keep working and discussing and brainstorming of trying to find a universal definition of fairness, which is basically just being objective. And, and I know that there are a lot of postmodern people who say there is no objectivity and all that. But you know, it, it, it is, you know, objectivity is that which is not subjective that which is uh, free from a prejudices, whatever those prejudices are, and, and there's objectivity, and, and you know, we have science, and the science works very, very well. So computer science is platonic. You have to find a platonic definition of fairness, and you take the kind of object objectivity as, as, as analogy, and anything that is, violates that is, is unfair, whatever the group is, whatever the demography, or, or, the, in or, or the interest of groups, or what have you. So. And, uh, I can only hope you're right. <laughs> oh, well, some of us, some of us would definitely not want platonic <laughs> conceptions of fairness to be the norm. In fact, Aristotle is the right place to start. Your final definition about the contextual nature of fairness, its political nature, and so forth, um, is actually, I would say, you know, how you get to sort of the question of how the concept of fairness universally operates. It's about this question of allocation of resources and goods in relationship to the concept of the public good, the common good, and human flourishing, but that requires immense um, collective decision making from one community to another. That's not the same thing as to suggest a relativist argument about the position or a postmodern one, so just to, to say that. Matthias? Thank you. I'm uh, Matthias Risse, director of the Carr Center uh, for Human Rights Policy and a political philosopher. I could actually ask my question in terms of this distinction between Platonic and Aristotelian also, but I won't. Um, <laughs> but, it's in a, but, it's in, but it's in a so similar okay, vein, actually. I have actually. an oracle here who can answer. So it's, uh, it's, I've been thinking about uh, you know, what, you, what you said about you know, when you worked on privacy, at least we knew what we were talking about because there's a kind of shared understanding of what privacy is. And, and then in fairness, it's all a kind of a mess and nobody quite knows, right? And so um, in terms of how computer science and philosophy can come together here, I'd like to uh, ask you one thing about this, namely, so f philosophers, uh, like to distinguish between concepts and conceptions. Yeah? So, and in terms of concept, I think we understand fairly well what we are talking about when we're talking about fairness. So here's, here's, here's the concept. The concept is people are owed certain things, people have you know, stringent claims of sorts to certain things, and fairness applies if these claims to something they're owed that people have are satisfied in proportion. 
And you say, oh, well, that's horribly abstract. And I say, yeah, that's horribly abstract. That's the concept, right? That's the concept. Uh, and it's, it's a concept as in we know, we, are now, we know now that we are not talking about beauty and lots of other things, right? This is what, the fa what fairness discourse is about, you know, proportionate satisfaction of stringent claims of sorts. Conceptions is, so then, then you ask all sorts of questions. What does this mean? How would people be owed this? And how would people be owed that? What does proportionality mean here? That's what a conception does, right? Then I spell this out, you know, I fill this in with more contents, and then I have a range of them, right? And then I can do a kind of work here to classify them and say, here's what this one is, here's what that one is, and, you know, philosophers have done this kind of work, right? And so, so then, uh, you know, when you, when you apply this, when you think about a situation, you say, what's fair here? Then you have to kind of wonder, you know, which of these conceptions kicks in here. So in terms of, th so this is what philosophers would do. Right? So in terms of computer science, so this is in a way the platonic part then, right? So what, what, you, what you do, by you're, looking at, you're looking at mathematical structures, right? You're looking at probability spaces. You're looking at, you want to identify, you know, general patterns there. So there is, a, there is a high level of abstractness, mathematical abstractness to that, that will be hard to connect to the conceptions that mm -hmm. we need. So, but so in, in a way, as a, as a way of thinking about this, the connection here between computer science and, and philosophy, so in a way what we as philosophers would need from you is not something, or even now we as also as citizens who want to know what this means in particular context, is not so much kind of general results. I mean, this is also important, but more important when we have identified a particular conception and we, you know, this applies in a particular scenario, then what kind of algorithm would connect to that and what can you show about this algorithm? So in a way, a lot more messy rock away from the platonic nice level of generality. I know I've, I know I've made my point in terms of platonic anyway, so, but, uh, <laughs> so I guess my question is, would you agree or disagree? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, uh, Danielle? <laughs> Danielle agrees and I'm studying with her, so. Um, so I, I don't have much to say on that except, except that I think sort of trying very hard to pattern match with what you're saying and what I know, um, that our main abstraction is this notion of a, of a metric, that there's some inherent, for, you know, this task specific notion of how similar or dissimilar people are. And one of the th reasons why I'm so interested in you know, working with people in, in, in uh, ethics and in politics and government is to try to get some sense of what should we be instantiating that with? How do, you know, what, what is the right thing to tell us or to, to fill in those distances for certain kinds of classification tasks or settings? And so that's, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I've been so t I've been tempted into concluding by saying one last thing about Aristotle because what, <laughs> sorry. But no, but Aristotle would say that the thing that defines societies in contrast from each other is precisely that they have a different metric for deciding in, in relationship to what criterion people are distant or near each other. So democracies have a metric of one kind. They focus on a kind of widespread human capacity and Aristocracies or oligarchies have a metric of another kind. They want to distinguish entirely in relationship to income, say, and classify according to an income distribution. That's very crude, but it just makes the point that sort of, of the question of the once and for all metric, um, another perspective would be every time a society settles on its metric, it's defining itself as a society. So that there's no once and for all answer to the question. It's back to the question of exactly how it is we want to decide what's salient mm -hmm. in our judgments in the first place, right? So it takes us back to the kind of underlying normative uh, dimension of the work. But that was marvelous, Cynthia. Thank you so much. For <laughs>